Okay, we are going to start our lecture on um, vital signs. So this is chapter 19 in your textbook. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, be mindful, this is a rather long lecture. Um, vital signs are one of the most important interventions and assessment features that we will be um, performing as nurses. So this is a very important chapter. All right, so vital signs, also known as VS for shorthand. Okay, so what are vital signs? So vital signs are a way of assessing physiologic, physiologic functions of the body, okay? Um, it's important that you know that assessing a client's vital signs is one of the most frequent assessments that you will do as a nurse, okay? It is used to reflect a trend, okay? Oh, we're always looking for a pattern when we're assessing vital signs. So there's, it's used to reflect a trend in the patient's state of health, and that's how we identify disorders, okay? Um, it also reflects the functional ability of the body systems. How are they um, reacting to what is, what is the patient's health status, okay? Um, even if vital signs are delegated to a nursing assistant, which they are allowed to be, nursing assistants can take vital signs, um, they are, you are still responsible for assessing their clinical meaning, meaning, okay? So you can delegate the um, obtaining of vital signs. However, you as the nurse are responsible for interpreting what those results mean. Your assistant is not allowed to do that. Therefore, accurate assessments and interpretation and documentation are vital. Um, so monitoring vital signs. So um, this is all determined by the frequency of monitoring them are determined by the agency and the setting, okay? The optimal frequency for assessing vital signs is gonna depend on the patient's condition and whatever's taking place in the hospital setting. Um, typically, all agencies are going to have a policy that are going to that's going to tell you how often to evaluate the vital signs. Um, also, providers' prescriptions sometimes um, they will write that they would like them to be done more often than your policy um, requires. Okay. Also, nursing judgment. Okay. Um, that's why critical thinking is so important to nursing skills because. If you notice that your patient is having some abnormal symptoms, getting a set of vital signs is a really great place to start to identify anything that could be abnormal or starting to brew within the patient's health, okay? Um, vital signs also help you to evaluate the patient in the context of your overall assessment of the patient, okay? So for example, you obtain an, a, an extremely high blood pressure but that patient states that they couldn't find a parking space and had to run up four flights of stairs to get here. Okay, so is their blood pressure normal? No, it's not normal at this time. However, you're taking these context clues. Your patient just had a crazy, um, they just did a crazy amount of activity to get here. They're probably flustered because they're they were upset about being late or whatever. They just went through this entire ordeal. And we know as nurses, or as you will learn in this PowerPoint, that blood pressure can reflect all of those things. So what should we do as the nurse in that situation? The appropriate thing to do would be to just let the patient calm down, give them five or 10 minutes, let them calm, retake their blood pressure appropriately. And then that's probably going to give you a more accurate reading into what their normal baseline would be. Okay, so again, just talking a little bit about facility and unit standards, which are different everywhere you go. Typically in a hospital, you're looking at every four to six hours, home health, every time you visit, um, any kind of clinical setting, every visit, if it's like an outpatient thing, and then um, skilled nursing facilities, which are long-term care facilities, typically weekly to monthly, depending on their insurance provider, actually. So that's all gonna depend on your client's presentation as well. So let's dig into vital signs a little bit more. So I want you to know that a full set of vital signs includes a temperature, a pulse, a respiration, a blood pressure, and an O2 sat typically, as well as a pain um, assessment, okay? So we're gonna go over most of these in here. 
um, during this PowerPoint, some of these, most of these skills you'll learn in lab as well as we dig into a little bit deeper. Okay, so temperature, let's talk about temperature regulation. So body temperature is the degree of heat maintained by the body. It's the difference between the heat produced by the body and the heat lost to the environment. Okay, so traditional or normal temperature, when we think about that, is about 98.6, okay? Um, but research shows that that's probably too high, okay? Um, an adult's internal temperature is called the core temperature, okay? So just know that there's a core temperature and there's a surface temperature, okay? So an internal temperature is the core temperature. So it's typically one to two degrees um, higher than the skin temperature, okay? And the methods of which you can obtain this core temperature is gonna be from a rectal temperature, um, which is going in through the bottom to get a temperature with the thermometer, um, tympanic, and that's through the ear, okay? Tympanic temperatures through the ear. Um, you can also get temperatures internally from a Foley catheter, which is not as, um, is not as common, but it is possible. Um, and then the gold standard for a core temperature is typically the pulmonary artery, which again, not as common unless it's a critically, critically ill patient. And then your surface temperature. So this is the same, same as your skin temp. Okay, what do you feel um, with your hand? How does that temperature feel? You obviously can't get a number gauge to that, but that's kind of what it's talking about. It's that superficial, okay? So you can obtain these from an oral temperature, um, which is through the mouth, an axillary temperature, which is under the armpit, and then a temporal temperature, which is kind of at that temporal artery on the side of um, the head and or the forehead area, okay? So when we're assessing temperature, we just know we're gonna follow the measurement of our, our, the measurement scale of our facility, which is again, gonna be different depending on where you work. We have to use approved equipment and we're gonna choose the safest and most accurate and most reliable site. So that doesn't mean that just because the core temperature is more accurate that we're gonna take rectal temperatures on every patient, okay? That's just not how it works. So when we talk about thermoregulation, so thermoregulation is the process of maintaining a stable temperature, okay? Um, a constant temp is a balance between heat production and heat loss, like we talked about. And um, when we talk about the hypothalamus, okay, so the hypothalamus actually works as a thermostat in your house, okay? So it gets readings from sensory receptors in the skin, and then it is the control center for the thermoregulation. So if a patient is too hot or a person is too hot, um, the hypothalamus is gonna activate compensatory mechanisms causing peripheral, so away from the heart, so in the arms and legs and other parts of the body, peripheral vasodilation, okay? Whenever I talk about vasodilation, which is a concept you need to become familiar with, we're talking about the blood vessels getting bigger and getting wider, okay? We talked about that a little bit in the last couple chapters. When we talked about vasodilation, when that happens and those blood, those blood vessels get bigger, it drops your blood pressure. It also causes redness to the surface of the skin, okay? It gives you that feeling of, um, of warmth, okay? That's vasodilation. So when you're too hot, again, your hypothalamus is gonna activate that mechanism that's gonna cause vasodilation and diaphoresis. So diaphoresis is just a fancy medical term for sweating, okay? And so that's how we're gonna cool the body down is by getting, um, is for, by sweating it out, okay? Now, if the hypothalamus realizes that we're too cold, it's gonna launch these mechanisms that are gonna cause vasoconstriction, okay? So that's where those blood vessels are getting smaller. They're tightening up, okay? The patient's also gonna start shivering and then epinephrine's gonna release, which all of these things are gonna increase the metabolism and try to warm up the body, okay? Those are all responses to cold and how your body works to warm itself up. So we talk about body heat production, we talk about metabolism. So remember from our last couple of chapters that metabolism is the sum of all physical and chemical processes within the body, okay? We know what a basal metabolic rate is now, right? It's the amount of energy required to maintain the body at rest. So a B, your BMR becomes more important as you learn about pharmacology and disease processes and, th and things like that, okay? But that is all encompassed in metabolism. So all of that is going to produce body heat, okay? Your BMR, 
all of the body processes that require energy from the food that you eat, it's going to increase your metabolism, which is going to increase your temperature, causing that body heat. Okay. Um, also, skeletal muscle movement. So, um, fuel required to utilize muscles is going to increase that body heat production. Okay. Catabolism, like we talked about in our nutrition chapter, the breakdown of those um, nutrients. So the breakdown or catabolism of fats and carbs is going to, um, in within the muscles is going to produce energy and heat. Okay. And then non-shivering thermogenesis. So this is the metabolism of brown fat to produce heat. Okay, this is typically only seen in infants because they're unable to shiver like kids and adults. So they get this non-shivering thermogenesis to help stabilize their body temperature. So temperature change mechanisms. So there's radiation, convection, evaporation, and convection. So with these, these are just all ways that we can um, lose our body heat, okay? Or gain, or gain our body heat. So with radiation, so if the uncovered skin is warmer than the air, the body loses heat through the skin. Okay, so this is why a cool room warms by radiation when it's filled with many people, right? So in contrast, a person can acquire heat by turning on a heat lamp or being in the sunlight, okay? And that would be radiation as well. So radiation accounts for almost 50% of body heat loss. Then there's convection. So with convection, nurses use this principle intentionally um, to affect changes in a patient's body temperature. So um, by immersion into a warm bath may raise the body temperature for a hypothermic patient, right? So in contrast, the currents of cool air produced by a fan can help reduce a fever. So that's also convection, okay? That accounts for about 15 to 20% of all heat loss to the environment. Um, evaporation. So this is water loss caused by insensible loss. So evaporation is affected by um, humidity or moisture in the environment. So if the air already contains a lot of humidity, then less moisture evaporates from the skin and less cooling is going to occur in those patients. And then there's conduction. So suppose that a patient's temperature is 98.6 degrees while he's fully dressed in um, the examination room. So if he dresses in a thin hospital gown and lies on a cool metal radiology table, his temperature is going to go down, possibly as much as a full degree um, Fahrenheit in that first hour, just from that conduction of um, that cool temperature will drop his temperature, right? Um, so other factors that influence body temperature, so developmental level, so infants especially, they're going to lose 30% of their heat through their heads. That's why we always tell moms and dads to put hats on their babes, okay, because they lose a ton of heat through their heads. Older adults have a difficult, more difficult time maintaining body heat because of their loss in their subcutaneous tissue, okay? They don't have that fatty tissue. Remember, fatty tissue insulates the body, and the elderly people do not have as much of that. So that being said, if you've ever been to a nursing home or at grandma's house when she's got the heat up to 95 degrees, that could be why. Um, our environment, is it hot outside? Is it cold outside? That's going to influence our body temperature. Gender, actually. So a woman's body temperature varies as much as one degree um, Fahrenheit when she gets her menstrual cycle or when she's pregnant. Um, hormonal fluctuations are commonly known as hot flashes can affect temperature as well and can even cause sweating. Exercise. So remember, because of skeletal muscle movement, we know that that can cause body heat production. So um, that's going to cause an increase in temperature as well. Emotions and stress, nervousness, stress. These can all stimulate the sympathetic nervous system and trigger that increase in metabolic rate, which in turn can increase body temperature. Okay. And then circadian rhythm. So the body has an internal physiological process that occurs every 24 hours. Okay. The circadian rhythm is our body's internal clock. Okay. That's why we wake up with energy in the morning and we get tired as it gets dark outside. That's our circadian rhythm. Um, so temperature can fluctuate one to two degrees Fahrenheit and is usually lowest in the early morning hours and highest in the afternoon and early evening hours. So if we were to um, see a patient that was maybe 98. 98.4 um, degrees Fahrenheit temperature in the early morning. And then we notice that maybe in the early afternoon or evening hours, they go up to 
we're still not going to be super concerned because we'll learn in a couple of slides that 99.6 degree Fahrenheit fever or temperature is not considered a fever. And we expect that one to two degree fluctuation from the morning to the evening. So that wouldn't be a huge concern. Um, yeah, and so that's it with that. Um, so variances in temperature. So now we're going to talk about fever or pyrexia is another term for fever in the medical world. Okay, so fever means a high body temperature, which is typically greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, again, that's something that's going to differ kind of between where you work and the physicians that you work with. A lot of physicians won't treat a fever until it gets above 100.4. That's the typical what I've seen in my own practice. Um, so fevers typically occur in response to pyrogens, also known as bacteria, okay? Pyrogens induce secretion of substances called prostaglandins. These prostaglandins reset the hypothalamic thermostat at an increased temp, okay? Hyperpyrexia, this is an abnormally high body temperature. This is where it gets a little dangerous or a lot dangerous. So hyperpyrexia is a fever greater than 105.8. That's an emergency, that's life threatening, okay? There's a bunch of different causes of um, fevers, um, such as heat exhaustion. Heat exhaustion can be a cause of a fever as well as infection, as we all know, um, but there's a variety of different causes. So when we're talking about heat exhaustion and heat stroke, these are typically due to overexposure to high temperatures and inadequate fluid, re fluid replacement, so dehydration because the body can't sweat out what it doesn't have, right? Signs and symptoms of this kind of thing, we're looking at weakness, nausea, vomiting, tachycardia, which is high heart rate, which you'll learn about today, tachypnea, which is a high breathing rate, which you'll learn about today, um, a headache, and then also flushed skin, okay? There's great info in your book on page 427 to 428 about heat exhaustion and heat stroke. So let's talk about the course of a fever. So um, the initial course of the fever. So this is the febrile episode. So this is the period when the body temperature is rising, but has not yet reached the new set point. So the onset of the fever may be sudden or gradual, depending on whatever it is that's causing the fever. Um, the person usually feels chilly and cold, just generally uncomfortable, may have some malaise um, and may shiver as well. So that's that initial, initial phase. That second phase of the fever, this is the period when the body temperature reaches its maximum and remains fairly constant at that new higher level. So this person is generally flushed looking, they feel warm and dry during this phase, which may last from a few days to a few weeks, right? And then the third phase, um, this is the period when the temperature returns back to normal. The, the person feels warm, appears flushed in response to that vasodilation. Remember, we talked about the blood vessels getting bigger causing the skin to look red because of that vasodilation, so that flushing effect. Um, diaphoresis is gonna occur in this stage or sweating, right? Which assists the heat loss by evaporation. Okay, so this phase is commonly referred to as the fever's breaking, right? Um, and so you need to know as well that um, fevers or increased temperatures can have an effect on the other vital signs as well. So an increased temperature causes an increased metabolic demand, okay? The, metabol the metabolism is going to increase because of that increased temperature, right? It's also going to lead to um, an increased heart rate, which typically the heart rate will increase about 10 beats per minute um, for every one degree Fahrenheit that the temperature is increased, okay? That's important for you to know that heart rate will increase about 10 beats per minute for every degree in temperature that is increased, okay? Um, and then variances in low temperature. So hypothermia, so this is when a core temperature is below normal. So typically less than, I think that I have the wrong sign there. I, I have greater than, I meant less than. So less than 95 degrees. Fahrenheit. Okay, that's hypothermia. So it's associated with extended exposure to cold weather. So extreme weather or immersion to cold water or lack of shelter or clothing or something like that can cause that. Um, so it's sometimes deliberately induced in as a treatment in a hospital setting 
under close monitoring to decrease the need for oxygen in body tissues. Um, sometimes you'll see this during um, cardiac or neurological surgery. They will induce hypothermia. So let's test your knowledge. So the nurse would monitor the body temperature most frequently in the care of a client, A, with infection, <clears throat> B, who is an infant, C, who has experienced heat stroke, or D, who has a head injury. The correct answer is D, a client has a head injury. So all of the clients depicted would need to have their temperatures monitored closely for sure. As with all nursing questions, all the answers are generally correct, but only one is the most correct, right? So a client with a head injury may have damage to the hypothalamus, okay? Remember that is the place that regulates thermodynamics in your body. So therefore, the loss of global thermal regulation is a super important consideration in this test question. And the temperature of this client would need to be monitored more frequently. Okay, you really gotta use your thinking cap with that question, okay? Moving on to pulse. I'm gonna talk about pulse rate. So what is the definition of a pulse? So a pulse is a rhythmic expansion of an artery produced when a bolus of oxygenated blood is forced into it by contraction of the heart. So that is literally what you're feeling when you're feeling your pulse rate. It's just your heartbeat, right? Um, and so when we talk about pulse, we talk about the rate. There's a couple of different things that we talk about and we consider when we are checking somebody's pulse, um, one of which being the rate. Okay, so the pulse rate, it's measured in beats per minute. Okay, so when we are feeling the pulse on our patient, we are counting for a full minute and we are counting how many beats we feel in that minute. A normal pulse rate is gonna be 60 to 100 beats per minute. Average 70 to 80 is what we're gonna typically see. Um, can be lower if there are a super, super athlete and sometimes it can even be higher and that's what we call tachycardia, which we'll talk about. Um, so the wave that begins when the left ventricle contracts and ends when the ventricle relaxes. So that's your lub dub, right? Your lub dub, one pulse. Lub dub, one pulse, one beat. Okay, one pulse, one beat. Um, so each contraction forces blood into the already filled, filled aorta, causing an increased pressure within the arterial system. Okay, so when we think about this, we're thinking about our systole. <clears throat> our systole, um, which is the peak of the wave, and then the diastole, which is the rest phase of the heart. Okay, so that's your lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Okay, you can see more information on this, um, this anatomy review on page 434 if you're still a little bit fuzzy on that. So when we talk about stroke volume. Stroke volume is something else that we need to consider when we're talking about pulse. So this is the amount of blood pumped out of the left ventricle in one contraction. So usually you're not gonna know your patient's actual stroke volume, though it averages about 70 mils, milliliters, right? In most healthy adults. So if stroke volume decreases, such as in a large blood loss or a hemorrhage, um, the body tries to maintain that same cardiac output by increasing the pulse rate, okay? So that's important for you to know, just as a nurse, if you are having a, um, if you're having a patient who's having a lot of bleeding, a very, um, a very first telltale sign of that is going to be a decrease in blood pressure, right? Because the, as the blood is coming out of the body and the patient is bleeding, that pressure in the vessels is going down. And then you're going to see an increased heart rate. And the reason for that is because that's what your body is trying to do is it's, it's a mechanism of compensation. It's trying to increase the heart rate so it can get more blood out to the vital organs and tissues um, to make up for what has been lost, okay? That will only last for a short time before the body gets exhausted if the bleeding doesn't stop. But that is the first signs that you're gonna see in a massive bleed, lower blood pressure, higher pulse, okay? Um, and then cardiac output, when we talk about that, this is the total quantity of blood pumped per minute, okay? It's expressed in liters per minute and it's calculated um, as follows. As you can see in my picture up here, so cardiac output is the stroke volume times the, the heart rate, the pulse rate in beats per minute, right? 
So for a person with a pulse of 80 beats per minute and an average stroke volume, which we said is 70 milliliters, the cardiac output would be about 5,600 mils or 5.6 liters per minute. Okay, that's cardiac output. And then with heart rate regulation. So heart rate's mainly um, uh, controlled by the autonomic nervous, nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system regulates the heart rate, okay? So with sympathetic stimulation, this is your fight or flight response. So we all know when we get nervous or scared or something, that increases our heart rate and thus it increases our cardiac output, okay? That's our sympathetic nervous system working. And then it's also can be, woo, whoopsee. I do this way too much in these PowerPoints with my scrolling. Okay, um, and so that's your sympathetic stimulation. Once we move to parasympathetic stimulation, that is what gets us back to our rest and digest response, right? So that's what decreases us. After we calm down, after somebody scared the crap out of us, we're resting, we're digesting, our parasympathetic nervous system is working and our heart rate decreases. So you can read these, um, these uh, pictures here on my slide to see that the sympathetic uh, nervous system versus the parasympathetic and how they affect the cardiovascular system. I always like to think about the nervous system, the sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system um, as if I'm being chased by a lion. Okay, what, what are the vital roles of my body when I'm being chased by a lion? Okay, so just kind of think about it that way. So factors that are going to influence pulse rate, so developmental level. So newborns are going to have a very rapid heart rate. It's so fast that sometimes it's really hard to count. So that rate typically stabilizes in childhood and gradually slows as they get to being an elderly person. The resting heart rate increases with age. However, the variability of it decreases, okay? Um, gender. So adult women have a slightly higher pulse rate than do adult men. And then exercise, muscle activity normally increases the pulse rate. We know that after exercise, um, we are having a high heart rate and that is sometimes the desired effect, right? So after exercise, a well-conditioned heart is gonna return to a normal rate more quickly. People who are typically well-conditioned are gonna have lower heart rates. So really athletic people, typically you will see sometimes their heart rate's about 50 even, can, can be considered too low, but it, it's healthy for them. Um, food intake. So the ingestion of a meal is going to cause a slight increase in the pulse rate for several hours after eating. And then stress. Uh, stress triggers that fight or flight, that sympathetic re response or being chased by a lion, right? So this is going to increase the pulse rate and the strength of the heart contractions or that stroke volume. Um, and then fever. So as we talked about a little bit on the last few slides about temperature, the pulse rate tends to increase about 10 beats per minute for every degree Fahrenheit of temperature elevation. Okay, again, that's something you need to know. Through these reasons are that the metabolic rate increases and in response to the, to the fever, peripheral vasodilation occurs, right? That causes that decrease in blood pressure. When those vessels get bigger, the blood pressure goes down. So then the body realizes, okay, the blood pressure's going down maybe we're bleeding, or maybe I need to do something to increase that blood pressure. So it starts to increase the heart rate. Okay. That's the reason behind that. Diseases such as heart disease, hyperthyroidism, respiratory diseases, and infections are generally associated with an increased pulse rate. Um, hypothyroidism, so a low or a slow thyroid, this is associated with a decreased pulse rate. And then blood loss, like we talked about. So Small blood loss is generally well tolerated and produces only a temporary increase in pulse rate. But theoretically, a large blood loss stimul stimulates that sympathetic nervous system, bringing about an increase in pulse rate to compensate for that decreased blood volume like we've talked about. Um, however, some research does show that vital signs are limited in their ability to detect large blood losses. Thus, a stable pulse and blood pressure are unreliable um, measures of the amount of loss. But still, during a blood loss, at least in the initial compensatory stage of the body, you will see a decreased blood pressure and an increased pulse. 
And then position state position changes. So standing and sitting positions are generally um, they generally cause an increase in pulse rate um, as a result of blood pooling in the veins and the legs and feet. This causes decreased blood return to the heart, decreasing the blood pressure, and subsequently increasing the heart rate. Right. So position changes. And then medication. So any type of stimulant stimulant drugs are going to increase the heart rate, like epinephrine or albuterol will also do that. Um, and then there's drugs that are cardiotonics like digitalis or digoxin. Um, these have a significant effect on the heart rate, um, and you shouldn't give it if the heart rate's less than 60. And you should always take, and this is with digitalis or digoxin, same med, okay? Two names, same med. Um, and that's a cardiotonic med. Always take an apical pulse rate, and we'll talk about that, an apical pulse rate for 60 seconds before giving that med and you never give it if the heart rate is less than 60. So that's important for you to know. Um, and then opioids, as we know, these can cause decreased pulse rate. It can slow pretty much everything down. It can cause a decreased pulse rate and a decreased respiratory rate. All right, and so common pulse points. So the pulse can be obtained in two ways. So, it can be obtained by palpation, which means to touch and feel, um, or it can be obtained by auscultation, which means to listen, okay? So the apical pulse reading is the most accurate place to listen to the heart rate. Um, so this is the most accurate place, okay? So in a healthy, in a healthy person, this is the most accurate place. Um, but the apical pulse rate and the peripheral pulse rate pulse rate, which remember peripheral just means away from the heart. So we're talking any other place on this picture that you can see that you can feel the, the heart rate. So typically the apical and the peripheral pulse rates are generally the same, okay? So these on the slide, you can see all of the typical places that you can locate the heart rate, okay? And you will need to know all of these in lab. You will need to show us where you find these areas. So I suggest using yourself and trying to find your pulse in all of these different areas on this, this picture, okay? So up here at the top, you'll see superficial temporal artery, right? And so with the temporal artery, it's located on the side of the forehead near the eyebrow, okay? You can feel your pulse right there. This picture also shows a facial artery, which is over here, kind of onto the side of like underneath the ear at the jawline. Um, that's not one that, that you're gonna be kind of checked off on. Um, but then there's the carotid artery. So with that one, it's between the midline and the side of the neck, um, typically is only used by CPR trained professionals in assessing circulation to that site, right? Um, we never want to palpate or touch and feel the two sides of the carotid artery at the same time, okay? You can never occlude those arteries at the same time because that, those arteries are what mainly supplies the brain. And so if you occlude both sides of those, your patient's gonna pass out. They have no blood supply to their brain, okay? Next, you'll see the brachial artery. So that one's slightly distal from the elbow. Um, and that's the one that you're going to um, assess when you're taking a blood pressure. Um, but you typically, and, and that, that's also the main one that you assess on a baby if you're feeling for a um, pulse rate. Then below that is your radial artery. So that's on the inner side of the wrist um, in line with the thumb, okay? Um, that's the main one that you're going to use. It's the most easily accessible. It's convenient. And um, that one's important. Um, so that's the one you're going to use for your checkoffs in lab is the radial artery. Next is the femoral artery. So I want you to consider once you make it down towards the second half of the body, and we're talking about um, these, these pulse rates down at the bottom, always remember in nursing and in healthcare that the lower extremities are always the farthest away from the heart, okay? So we always kind of worry about or consider perfusion issues in the lower extremities. So as we start to get down to the femoral artery, all the way down to that dorsalis pedis, 
we're thinking about, is this patient getting good perfusion to their lower extremities? Okay, so that femoral artery is right there. Um, you don't routinely check your patient's femoral artery, but that artery is used for things like heart catheterizations. So that's where they go in because um, it's a main central artery right there. Um, and then the next would be the popliteal artery. So this one's located behind the knee. The posterior tibial artery, this is located on the inner aspect of the ankle. And then um, your dorsalis pedis, that is otherwise known as your pedal pulse. Um, and it is uh, these two together, which the, the dorsalis pedis is on top of the foot. So these two, the tibial and the dorsalis pedis pulses are going to give you a really good indicator of how good the circulation is in the lower extremities. Okay, so super important, especially when you're assessing patients after surgery and also diabetic patients, because we worry about their um, circulation to their feet. So when to measure an apical pulse, okay? So apical pulse is something that you listen to, okay? You can probably also feel, I know I can feel it on myself as well, but um, there is a picture on the next slide that I'll show you exactly where to locate this at. But when you're thinking about it, this is something you're going to listen to with a stethoscope. Okay, so it's located in the chest right at the point of maximal impulse of the heart. So it's where you can hear it the best. Okay, so when are we going to listen to an apical pulse versus actually feeling for a pulse? So it's important for you to know that the radial pulse there in the wrist is typically we, um, it's, it's typically normal, but if you're feeling it, um, and it feels weak or irregular, that would be a good time to measure an apical pulse instead. If you notice that um, the radial pulse is less than 60 or greater than 100, then listening to the apical pulse to make sure um, would be a good step. Um, we always, always, always measure the apical pulse in patients taking cardiac medications like digoxin or digitalis. Again, those are the same med, just two different names. And it's a big cardiac med that can be very harmful if you give it when the heart rate is less than 60. So we always, always listen to an apical pulse when giving that medication. Okay, no exceptions. And then the patient, if they're an infant or a child up to age three, we're always listening to the apical pulse rather than actually listening or feeling for a pulse. Okay, they're very squirrely. Um, so obtaining a pulse rate. So when we talk about listening for an apical pulse, this is where we're going to listen. You see my little yellow arrow there. Um, you can see that the heart is actually kind of weird shaped where that, um, that right side of it, or, you know, if you're looking at this picture, the right side is kind of cone shaped down at the bottom. And that right there by that rib um, is the, called the point of maximum impulse. So that's where you can hear best. Okay, so you're going to use a stethoscope to auscultate or listen to the number of heartbeats at that apex of the heart. So apical pulse rate, mitral heart pulse rate, um, apex of the heart, point of maximal impulse, all of those things mean the exact same thing. And all that it means is that this is the location right here where that yellow arrow is pointing. Okay, so when you're doing that, you're going to need a watch or a clock with a second hand and um, and a digital display so that you can count for at least 60 seconds. One heartbeat is one series of the love dub. So you'll hear bum bum, and that's one, bum bum, and that's one, bum bum, and that's one, right? Okay. Um, you can see in procedures 19.2 and 19-3 um, in your book how to do these skills, um, starting on page 462 and ending on page 467. And then variances in pulse rate. So um, again, so when we're talking about measuring the pulse rate, we're looking for a number. The rate of your pulse is a number, right? And so we're going to learn the definitions for these corresponding numbers. So we know that a normal pulse rate is anywhere from 60 to 100. So that would be a normal pulse rate. Um, bradycardia, remember brady means slow. So bradycardia means a heart rate less than 60 beats per minute. Okay, tachycardia means a heart rate more than 100 beats per minute. Okay, so tachy means high, right? Um, so remember, I talked to you earlier, we talked about the multiple things that we look at with a heart rate. So we are with assessing a pulse. So we look at the rate, which is a number. We also look at the rhythm. So what is the rhythm of the pulse? This is 
the intervals that are heard between each beat. So does each beat come as you expect it to? Bum, 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 bum. You expect it to come and then it comes. That is a regular pulse rate. If it was irregular, it would do, it would feel or sound something like this. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. Just very not predictable and doesn't come as you expect it to. So that would be irregular. So that's the rhythm. Was it, is it regular or is it irregular? Okay. And then we're looking at the quality. So what's the quality of the pulse? So with that, we are determining um, the pulse volume and equality between the pulse of, on both sides of the body, right? So when we're talking about um, the quality of the pulse, is it bounding? Bounding means you can really feel some pressure of the beat underneath your fingers. Or is it thready? Thready means weak. Or is it like you can barely find it's a very kind of weak pulse rate? Either one, okay? Um, so that's the quality, okay? And then you can also rate um, the pulse quality as um, on a scale of zero to four. A lot of times you'll see this in healthcare settings um, where it's a zero to four scale, two is considered normal, which would just mean it's a normal, it's not bounding, it's not thready. Um, and then as you get to plus four pulses, that means like, oh, that's crazy. They have a bounding pulse rate. So they have a lot of fluid volume in there. Or if you get to a zero, it's like, the patient's like, a, a, there's no pulse at all, right? You can't even feel a pulse there. A plus one would be a little thready and weak, right? If you ever feel like you have an absent pulse, you just need to consider that this is your error, okay? Um, or that your patient does not have blood throw, flow through that artery. So one or the other. So you need to kind of maybe call for backup at that point. You need to assess that patient's extremity. So if you feel for a pulse rate on a diabetic's foot and you don't feel that pedal pulse, um, you're gonna look at that foot and you're gonna say, does this, does this patient's foot have other signs of decreased blood flow? So is it cold? Is it super cold? Is it bluish in color? Is it white in color? Is it pale? Um, those are kind of things that you're gonna be looking for to really make your decision. Okay. And then as we were just talking about inadequate circulation. So if circulation is compromised, paleness or cyanosis or blueness, cyanosis, you need to know that term, will be present. Okay. So with pallor or paleness, so pallor, this is the paleness of the skin when compared with another part of a body. That tells us that they have inadequate circulation. Cyanosis, this is a bluish or grayish discoloration. Um, of the skin due to increased CO2 and decreased O2 in the blood, okay? So this is a preliminary finding. As I said, you need to do further investigation to determine what is causing this and especially um, be uh, in communication with the physician, okay? And so here you can see 10 warning signs of poor blood circulation. So numbness in the hands and feet, persistent fatigue and tiredness, sudden hair loss, swelling of the lower extremities. Oh, and let me speak on sudden hair loss is not just with the hair on your head. If you notice that somebody has no leg hair or no arm hair or no hair on their body, that is a sign of poor circulation. That hair needs blood flow to grow, okay? Um, varicose veins can be a sign. Skin discoloring, paleness or cyanosis, cold hands and feet, erectile dysfunction, tightness or heaviness in the chest, and a weak immune system and slow healing. That's the big one with the diabetics, okay? And so let's talk about nursing diagnoses with these patients. So these are approved nursing diagnoses for patients with cardiac or pulse um, variances, okay? Keep in mind that pulse changes are symptoms of a problem. They are not the problem. We need to figure out what is causing these symptoms. So these nursing diagnoses are going to be useful in describing a condition that is causing the pulse changes, okay? By itself, a change in pulse, such as being weak or thready, is not adequate to support the following diagnoses. Um, other symptoms must also be present, okay?
So outcomes and interventions with these patients. So vital sign status is the only outcome that's directly pertaining to um, assessing the pulse. Um, all of these outcomes are gonna really depend on what's going on with your patient at the time. Let's test your knowledge. So the nurse is assessing the dorsalis pedis pulses on an 88 year old client. She notices that the feet are cool and assess assesses weak, thready pulses. What should the nurse do next? A, assess the popliteal and femoral pulses. B, assess a one minute apical pulse. C, notify the provider stat. Or D, apply a warm pack and reassess in 20 minutes. Correct answer is A, completing an assessment of other peripheral pulses will provide further data about the adequacy of circulation to the legs. So you may be thinking, I'm gonna go back to that question. You may be thinking, but you just told me to assess the one minute apical pulse if we notice that pulses are weak or thready or abnormal. And that is true. However, I want you to think deeper when you look at this particular question, because when we're talking about the lower extremities, that always gets a little bit more tricky than just any other extremity, okay? So when we're talking about the lower extremities, they're always at risk more than any other extremity to get less or decreased blood flow. So when you're talking about you've noticed a decrease in this and that her feet are cold and her pulse is weak and thready, we need to further investigate. We need to look at the other pulses that are in that area and see where, where does the blood supply cut off? If we feel and she doesn't have any popliteal pulse, but she does have a femoral pulse, that tells us that there's probably a, an issue between the femoral and the popliteal pulse, and then we need to call the physician because circulation is impaired, okay? All right, moving on to respiration. So respiration, so the mechanical process of respiration involves the active movement of air into and out of the respiratory system, okay? This is known as pulmonary ventilation, like we talked about in our oxygenation chapter, okay? More commonly known as breathing, pulmonary ventilation, breathing, same thing, okay? Um, so the chemical process of, we'll talk about, well, actually, we'll talk about this in a second. So first of all, normal respirations, we're talking about normal respiratory rate, RR for short, as you'll see my shorthand here, normal respiratory rate. Remember, rate is always a number. So the rate is going to be 12 to 20 breaths per minute. That's a very general normal respiratory rate, okay? Um, so remember that the, the process of respiration involves two separate processes, mechanical and chemical respiration, okay? So when we're talking about the mechanical part of respiration, we're talking about breathing, taking in air, breathing out CO2, taking in oxygen, taking out CO2, okay? The active movement of air in and out of that respiratory system, that's the mechanical part. The chemical part is the actual um, exchange of those um, of those CO2, oxygen, and kind of what happens at the chemical level in the body, okay? So external respiration, that's the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the alveoli. Remember, the alveoli is those little sacs in the lungs, okay? And this and the pulmonary blood supply, all of that includes external respiration. It includes gas transport. So the transport of those gases, the oxygen taking the bloodstream, taking the oxygen where it needs to go, and then taking the CO2 where it needs to go to get exhaled. And then internal respiration, which is the exchange of these gases between the capillaries and the body tissue cells, okay? So the mechanical process of respiration involving movement of the air into and out of the respiratory, out of the respiratory um, system, okay? As you can see here, inspiration, what happens during inspiration? That diaphragm is going to contract, okay? You can see it's going to go down. The diaphragm is going to push down when you take a breath in, okay? In expiration, that diaphragm is going to suck up to blow that air out. This is just kind of a little visual for you. Then also changes in the thoracic cavity, as you can kind of see um, during inspiration. So breathing in, your lungs are going to expand and then that diaphragm is going to go 
down. And then when you're breathing out during expiration, your lungs are going to go back in, get a little smaller. They're going to recoil. And then that diaphragm is going to raise up and it's all going to push that air out of your, um, out of your mouth. And so that you can, or nose and you can breathe that out. Right. So we're talking about counting respirations, respiratory rate and regulation. Okay. So do remember that rate is going to vary as with all other vital signs with age exertion. Okay. With age, babies breathe super fast. Okay. It's going to vary with exertion. How, how much are you working? And we'll get into this in a little bit. Um, emotions and then other factors, which we'll talk about in a second. Right. And then what are your regulators? What's regulating your breathing? Okay. So the primary stimulus for breathing is the level of CO2 in your blood. Okay. CO2 is toxic to us. So once we get that to be too high, that's when we start to, to be regulating our breathing rate, maybe faster or slower than what it was before. So central chemoreceptors in the body are sensitive to CO2 and hydrogen. So minor increases in either one of those is going to stimulate additional respirations. And then you have peripheral chemoreceptors, which are in the carotid and aortic bodies. The partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is normally 80 to 100. So when it falls below normal, those peripheral chemoreceptors stimulate respirations. Okay, so that's kind of what happens at that level. So factors that influence reg, um, respirations, developmental level, like we talked about, babies breathe fast, typically anywhere from 30 to 60 breaths per minute. They can get up to 90 as long as it's for a short time and maybe as they transition to life outside of the room or womb, sorry. And then exercise, obviously exercise is going to increase our breathing rate. We all know that pain will increase our breathing rate. Stress will increase our breathing rate. Smoking will increase our resting breathing rate and will result in changes in airway elasticity. Fever, as we know now, fever just affects all the vital signs. So when the heart rate increases because of the fever, the respiratory rate also increases. For every one degree Fahrenheit, the temperature rises, the respiratory rate may increase up to four breaths per minute. That's wild. And then um, hemoglobin. So respiratory rate and depth increase as a result of anemia. So if you remember hemoglobin, that's that oxygen carrying molecule in your blood. Okay, that's a big deal there. That is what makes you feel, it makes you have energy to do your daily tasks because your body and your blood are well oxygenated. So if you have anemia and your hemoglobin is low um, or uh, you have anemia or sickle cell anemia, or if you're at a high altitude even, um, it increases, uh, it, it can just, it can cause problems with re your respiratory rate will increase as your hemoglobin drops because it needs to make up for that oxygen that's not there. Um, and then disease, so brainstem injuries or increased intracranial pressure, this may interfere with that respiratory center, right? That hypothalamus. So we always want to think about brain, brain problems with that. Um, and then, um, Medication. So as we know, opiates, right? Opiates are going to decrease respiratory rate. That's a big risk with them. Caffeine can cause shallow and fast respiratory rate. Positioning. So standing up is going to maximize that respiratory depth. That's why we tell you to sit your patient up as high as they can in the bed when they can't breathe very well. So sitting in high fowlers is a great position as long, but if the closest you can get to standing position is best. Um, laying down flat is going to reduce that respiratory depth. Slumping is going to prevent that chest expansion, right? Um, so when counting the respiratory rate, so typically breathing is an involuntary action that requires little effort, okay? However, it is possible to exert physical control over our respirations, which is why if we want to control our breathing, we can do that, right? We can be conscious of our breathing and breathe when we want and not breathe when we don't want to, right? Um, so when we're actually counting the respiratory rate, we always want to start by counting the pulse, like we just talked about. So you're sitting there with your patient's radial, your patient's wrist with their, your fingers on their radial artery and you're counting their, their pulse. The correct way to continue on to count the respiratory rate is to continue to sit there as if you're counting their pulse still 
And then you go on to just look at their breathing and count their respiratory rate at that time. The reason for this is because then your patient, if you tell your patient, I'm going to count your respirations, they're going to alter the way that they breathe. They might not know it. They might not even do it intentionally, but they're going to be consciously aware of how they're breathing and it's going to cause problems for them or for you rather getting an accurate reading on their respiratory rate. So we want to just go directly into counting respirations after counting the pulse. Okay. So step one, count the respiratory rate after taking the radial pulse without moving positions. Okay. Um, the patient can alter their rate and patterns. So we want to be discreet about it. We don't want to tell them ever that we are counting the respirations. Okay. Respiratory rate must be accurate. Okay. Please remember when you're counting a respiratory rate, one respiration is one rise and one fall of the chest. That is one respiration. You do not count them separately. So that's one, that's one, okay? So variations in respiratory rate assessment findings. So again, respiratory rate, this is the number of times a person breathes or completes one cycle of inhalation and exhalation within one full minute, okay? Just like the heart rate, it's within one full minute. So with the rate, you could have apnea, which means the cessation of breathing. There is no breathing for this period of time. Um, bradypnea, which is abnormally slow respirations, as you can see in my picture, or tachypnea, which is abnormally fast respirations, right? So as with heart rate, where we check the um, rate, rhythm, and quality of the heart rate, when we're talking about respiratory, uh, checking respirations, we're going to assess the rate, which is a number, and then we're going to check the depth, right? Are they, um, so like the respiratory depth can be described as deep. So this means they're taking very, taking in a very large volume of air, fully ex expanding their chest or their abdomen. So <sighs> that's a very deep respiration. It can be shallow when the chest barely rises and is difficult to observe. Or it can be normal, which falls between shallow and deep in the, in the middle somewhere. Um, and then along with respiratory rate and depth, we're going to assess the rhythm. So similar to heart rate, the rhythm is either regular or irregular, right? So does it come as you expect it to come or does it not? Does it have a pattern, okay? Um, and so then you can see, which I know you've seen this picture before on, on in our oxygenation chapter, but this shows you all of the different um, respiratory patterns that are possible. So Shane Stokes, right? We talk about Shane Stokes. That's a gradual increase in depth of respirations followed by a gradual decrease and then a period of apnea, okay? And then Biot's respirations, irregular respirations of a variable depth, typically shallow, alternating with periods of apnea. And then Kuzmal's respirations. These are respirations that are regular, but are abnormally deep and in an increased rate. Okay, so Kuzmal's respiration is not on this picture of mine, but you do need to know what that is. Okay, you do need to know what that is. I know that it, they talk about it in your book. So make a, make a note to yourself to review that in your book so that you can memorize what that is. All of these others should be reviewed from our oxygenation chapter. Um, and then along with assessing rhythm, we're going to assess the effort. So we want to know about the respiratory effort. So what degree of work is required for this patient to breathe? So if they have normal respiratory effort, then their breathing is effortless, just like you and me. They just breathe normally, no signs of looking, you know, distressed or anything. Um, when you get into patients who have respiratory problems, such as asthma or pneumonia, the person may work harder to breathe. And then you'll see them just like, <sighs> and you can't see me, but you can imagine what I look like when you hear that sound. Um, you start to see retractions, which is where they are breathing in so deeply that you can see the spaces in between their ribs, or you can see that that's the spots in between the bones and their neck um, and things like that. And we'll talk about that more in our physical assessment chapter, but that's, um, that's kind of what you're talking about when you're talking about respiratory effort, okay? And then there's dyspnea, right? So dyspnea meaning labored breathing, 
And then orthopnea. So with orthopnea, this is patients who are having difficulty breathing when they're laying flat, okay? So with orthopnea, you'll see patients say that they maybe sleep in a chair at night because it's easier for them to breathe. So let's test your knowledge. So the nurse will expect to find a slower respiratory rate in a client who has smoked for many years, true or false? Uh, correct answer is B, false. So clients who have smoked over many years will have an increased respiratory rate to compensate for that loss of elasticity in the airway. Okay. All right, so variations in respiratory rate continued. So these here are all different sounds that you can hear when you're listening to lung sounds, okay? So when we talk about listening to lung sounds, we are talking about a portion of your physical assessment, which you will find in the physical assessment video. So um, we'll review that there as well. But these definitions you need to know. You need to know what these sounds are and kind of what they may point to as well. Okay, so when you're listening to all the lung fields to a patient when they're breathing, and these are not sounds that you'll normally be able to hear without a stethoscope, even though sometimes you can. Um, but this is really what you're listening to with lung sound. So a wheeze. Wheezes are caused by narrowing of the airways. So the airways have gotten smaller. Um, these ones you can definitely hear sometimes without a stethoscope. Okay, so they're high pitched. They're continuous and musical sounds usually heard on expiration, which means when they're breathing out, okay? You'll see this a lot, like I said, with a, low, uh, a narrow airway. So patients that have asthma or are have a lot of mucus in their, their um, airway from pneumonia or something like that. Um, ronchi, so this is a low pitched continuous sound due to secretions in those large airways. So a lot of times if you're hearing ronchi on your patient, you can just ask them to cough. And a lot of times that will clear it up. Um, you hear this a lot in smokers, okay? Um, and then there's crackles. So crackles are sounds that are usually heard on inspiration, so when breathing in, right? And they're, dis they're described as similar to the sound made by rubbing strands of hair together with your fingertips, which I think is kind of weird. But to me, it just sounds like little popping, high-pitched popping sounds, or like a low-pitched type bubbling sound. And so when we're hearing crackles, you should be thinking about a wet environment. So typically you'll hear crackles when there's too much fluid. There's gotten to be fluid in the lungs, which you never want, okay? So maybe they have fluid overload or something. Um, crackles you will see in congestive heart failure, um, fluid overload or over, way over hydration, things like that. Um, pulmonary edema, these are all situations that are not good. So crackles always think wet, there's fluid in there. Um, strider. So this is a high pitched sound heard primarily during inspiration. And so they actually, they describe this as a piercing sound that almost sounds, um, sounds like a seal almost just like a, like a barking of a seal. And that's just the air coming through a narrowed airway, a severely narrowed airway. Okay. Um, and it can often be heard without a stethoscope as well. Um, a lot of times this is a sign of respiratory distress. Strider is not a sound that you ever wanna hear in real life. And then stertor, this is labored breathing that produces a snorting sound, okay? Common with mouth breathing due to nasal congestion. If you've ever heard a death rattle, um, this is a, a type of stertist breathing as well. And so here, um, there is a video, which, you know, my favorite registered nurse are in here. And a lot of times my, for some reason it won't play in my PowerPoint, but you guys all have copies of this PowerPoint. I encourage you to come back into this PowerPoint and um, listen to this review of abnormal lung sounds from registered nurse RN. It is really great. Um, to help you understand that. And this is going to be something that will help you mostly in lab um, with those skills as you start to do that in there.
Um, okay, and so with chest and abdominal movement, so the chest or the abdomen normally rises with inspiration and falls with expiration in a gentle and rhythmic pattern, okay? So when a person is having difficulty moving air into or out of the lungs, the respiratory pattern is gonna change. So like we talked about, you may see retractions in patients that are having respiratory distress. Retractions are never, ever a good thing, ever. And they should be a warning sign to you to be scared and get your interventions in place ASAP. So there's multiple different kinds of retractions. So an intercostal retraction refers to the visible sinking of tissues around or between the ribs. So that is just an, just an easy way to say as they breathe in super deep, you can see that space in between their ribs. Remember that costal usually refers to the ribs. Okay, so in intercostal retractions. Um, substernal retractions are another type. So this happens when those tissues are drawn in beneath the sternum or the breastbone. You can see in my picture, um, substernal retractions. You can see right there, kind of at that um, cyphoid process area. And then suprasternal retraction. This one happens when tissues are drawn in above the clavicle. So right there at that shoulder girdle, you can see that in my picture as well. Um, so again, these are never, ever good. And these are just caused from over, over exerted respiratory effort, deep, deep, deep breaths in where you can see those spaces. Um, other signs. So when you're assessing respiration, it's important to assess for clinical signs of oxygenation and perfusion as well. So signs of hypoxia, um, these are going to include pallor, so paleness or cyanosis, like we talked about. Um, also, restlessness and apprehension. If somebody can't breathe, they're going to have some anxiety about it. It's a very scary thing. Um, they're, they might have confusion, even if they just have hypoxia, but they're not having necessarily trouble breathing. They may exhibit a lot of confusion. You'll see this in patients that are elderly, especially. Um, they're not getting enough oxygen to the brain and they get confused. They may also um, show decreased level of consciousness, dizziness, fatigue, tachycardia, tachypnea, and changes in blood pressure as well. Um, when we're evaluating um, cyanosis, okay, so you see the cyanosis in this picture, those are blue lips, okay, that's a sign of poor oxygenation. So when we're evaluating this in the tongue or the oral mucosa, these are the best indicators of hypoxia. So if you look at the tongue, the tongue would be bluish tint, the sides of the cheeks would be a bluish tint. Um, but it may also be related to cold or reduced circulation in that area, okay? A lot of chronic hypoxia can also cause clubbing of the, the fingernails. And I think I have a picture of that in this slide or in this slideshow. So hopefully I'll be able to show you that. But clubbing of the fingers is also a sign of chronic hypoxia. You'll see that a lot in patients with like COPD or chronic cardiovascular disease. And then a cough. This is something else we should assess for. So um, coughs can be symptoms of allergic reactions, lung disease, or respiratory infection. They may be constant or they may be intermittent. So intermittent meaning they don't happen all the time, just comes and goes, right? Remember that they can be productive, which means we're coughing up sputum of some kind, or they can be non-productive, which is where it's just a dry cough and nothing comes up. Um, tools uh, used to measure oxygenation. So there's something called an ABG or an arterial blood glass. So this is going to be the most accurate way to measure oxygenation um, because it directly measures the partial pressures of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and it measures the blood pH. Okay. Um, with, a, with an arterial blood gas, though, it's very invasive. So an artery is actually punctured, not a vein, an artery. So the same area in which you feel the pulse is punctured. And then a blood sample is taken from there. And that's how we get actual um, oxygenation. This is not done routinely unless there is some serious, um, some serious things happening to this patient, okay? So this isn't something we would do at a doctor's office is what I'm saying. Um, so that's when we get to pulse oximetry, okay? Which I counted this as one of your vital signs. And this is, this is something you'll be checked off on as well in um, lab, okay? So with the pulse oximetry, you'll see a pulse oximeter in the picture on this slide. Um, and this is great because it's non-invasive, okay? Just put this little machine on their finger and it monitors, uh, it gives us a way of monitoring the respiratory status, okay? It measures the oxygen saturation. So what this is actually doing, it's showing a red LED light 
that goes through your finger and it measures the amount of hemoglobin mo molecules that are saturated with oxygen. And so that gives you a number value, a percentage value. And with that, it gives you up to 100%, okay? So 100% would be great. We really want it to be about above 95%. And anything kind of less than that is, um, we're just gonna have to communicate that to our provider, right? So if you look at this picture, um, what do you see that is abnormal on this picture of this pulse oximeter? So when we look at this picture, um, it's important for you to know, and we'll show you this in lab as well, that this measures, um, a pulse oximeter measures pulse um, oxygenation, okay, pulse oxygenation. So um, I'm sorry, blood oxygenation, which is the percentage value, which is the 100 number in this picture. It also measures your pulse, okay? And so the pulse being the second number in this picture, which is 132. So we know that this patient is having some tachycardia because their pulse, their, their pulse rate is 132. So ventilation and oxygenation. With hyperventilation, this is a rapid and deep breathing that is resulting in excess loss of CO2, hypocapnia. Body does not have enough CO2 because the patient is breathing it off super fast. This client may complain of feeling lightheaded or tingly, right? Um, this can be caused by anxiety, infection, fever, shock, things like that. Drugs can cause this, amphetamines especially. Um, and then hypoventilation. So this is where the rate and depth of respirations are low and the CO2 is retained in the body. Okay, causes from that, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, general anesthesia, impending respiratory failure, and drugs like heroin can cause this as a suppressant. Both of these are dangerous. All right, moving on to blood pressure. So blood pressure, it is an important indicator of overall cardiovascular health. Okay, the pressure in the blood as it is forced against the arterial walls during a cardiac contraction is your blood pressure. Okay, literally pressure of the blood as it's forced against the arterial walls. Okay, um, it's measured in millimeters of mercury and it's recorded as two numbers, a systolic pressure, which is your top number and your diastolic pressure, which is your bottom number. So 120 over 80, your systolic would be 120, your, your diastolic would be 80. Okay. So that's how it's recorded. <clears throat> and that's what it is. So your systolic blood pressure. So what this is, this means, remember that's your top number. This is how much pressure blood is exerting against your artery when the heart beats. Okay. So that's the working phase of the heart is the systolic. Your diastolic number or your bottom number, this is how much pressure your blood is exerting against the artery walls while the heart is resting between beats. So that's your resting phase of the heart, okay? That's why providers get so worried when that bottom number creeps up because that means that even at rest, your heart is working super hard, okay? And then the pulse pressure. So the pulse pressure, this is an indication of volume output of the left ventricle. So generally the pulse pressure should be no greater than one third of the systolic pressure as in the example of this. So a patient has a, um, and remember, it's just the difference between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. So for example, if your patient has a blood pressure of 120 over 80 with a pulse pressure of 40, okay? Right, 120 minus 80 is 40, and then a third of 120 would be 40, so that would be fine. So blood pressure regulation, it's important to know that blood pressure regulation is influenced by three factors, cardiac function, okay, peripheral vascular resistance, and blood volume. So when talking about cardiac function, cardiac output, okay, this is the volume of blood pumped by the heart per minute. We know this now. And it reflects the functioning of the heart. So an increase in cardiac output is going to cause an increase in blood pressure. A decrease in cardiac output is going to cause a decrease in blood pressure, okay? Second factor, peripheral vascular resistance. So this refers to arterial and capillary resistance to blood flow as a result of friction between the blood and the vessel walls, 
Okay, so increased peripheral resistance relates to a temporary increase in blood pressure. Um, and the amount of friction and resistance depends on the blood viscosity, right? Or the thickness, how thick is your blood? How thin is your blood, right? It's also going to depend on your arterial size and then the elasticity of your vessels. Okay, so the walls and the veins are thin and very distensible. So they have little influence on peripheral vascular resistance. Okay, so when you're thinking about peripheral vascular resistance, just think about how tight are the blood pressure, are the blood vessels or how loose are they, okay? Vasodilation makes them loose, vasoconstriction makes them tight. Both of those in, encompass that peripheral vascular resistance, okay? And then blood volume. So the normal blood volume um, in the body is about five liters or 5,000 mils. Okay, a significant volume decrease such as in a hemorrhage or fluid losses is going to reduce that vascular volume. And then that's going to cause that BP, that blood pressure to drop like we talked about, right? So when that vascular volume is increased above the normal, as occurs with like kidney failure or fluid retention, the blood pressure is going to increase because there's more fluid in the vessels and the pressure will go up, right? So then factors that influence blood pressure. So developmental factors. So the smaller the age, the lower the normal blood pressure. It typically goes up with age. Um, as far as gender, men usually have slightly higher blood pressure than women. But after menopause, a woman's blood pressure tends to increase, possibly due to a decrease in estrogen. Um, but men are higher than women until menopause, and then women are higher than men after menopause. Um, family history. So a history of hypertension is going to increase your likelihood of getting it. Lifestyle factors. Increased sodium consumption. That's a big one. That's an important one. It contributes to blood pressure so much. Increased sodium consumption. Smoking is going to increase your blood pressure. Consumption of more than three alcoholic drinks per day or caffeine and obesity. These can all raise your blood pressure. And then exercise. So exercise can actually reduce blood pressure, but will temporarily increase it as a result of the increase of physical activity and increased heart rate and the increased cardiac output. 30 minutes after physical activity, um, typically the blood pressure is back to normal baseline and exercise over time is, has been known to help decrease blood pressure. Um, body position. So blood pressure is higher when a person is standing rather than when they're sitting or lying down. So seated readings are higher in the client um, if the feet are dangling rather than if they're resting on the floor. So when you're taking a patient's blood pressure, you wanna make sure that they're sitting up, their, their legs are not crossed, okay? Because their legs being crossed can actually increase their blood pressure as well. With their feet flat on the floor, not dangling, things like that, okay? There's actually a procedure called an orthostatic blood pressure. You need to know what this is, okay? So with an orthostatic blood pressure, this is um, what, providers may order to be taken. And what it is, it's a series of blood pressures. So it is a um, series of blood pressures. You'll take one blood pressure while the patient is lying down when it should be lowest, right? You'll take it while they're lying down. Then you'll sit them up and you'll take it then. And then you'll have them stand and you'll take it then. So in an orthostatic blood pressure reading, you'll have three different values. Always start with them lying down, then get them sitting, then get them standing in that order. Okay. Um, and so if they have like a decrease of the systolic pressure by more than 20 or a diastolic pressure of more than 10, when a patient stands up, that's going to be your orthostatic hypotension. Okay. So we want to see if, have you ever like stood up too fast? You've sat down or even laying down, you stood up too fast. That's why we want to see if it drops when they, when they stand up or change positions. Okay. Causes of this orthostatic hypotension could be um, medications, it could be dehydration, it could be age-related changes, things like that, okay? Um, and then stress, fear, worry, excitement, these kind of things can all cause blood pressures to rise, okay? Pain, pain can cause an increase in blood pressure as well. African-Americans tend to have a higher rate of hypertension, and then many medications can alter blood pressure as well. Um, they may be intended, um, as blood pressure results may be intended as in if you're giving an antihypertensive medication, you want their blood pressure to go down, right? Um, but blood pressures may also drop not as the intended result, such as when you give an opiate, it does decrease the blood pressure as well. 
So methods to measure blood pressure. So there's an indirect or non-invasive ways to measure the blood pressure, and then there's direct methods, okay? So if you're doing a non-invasive or indirect um, blood pressure, this is the most common that you're going to see in a, in, a, in a clinic setting or that you're going to really probably use as a nurse unless you're in like a critical, critical area. So it's accurate. It's an accurate estimate of arterial blood pressure. Um, and it's obtained by external measuring devices. So for these types of blood pressures, you're gonna need a sphygmomanometer, say that 10 times fast, and a vinyl cloth cuff, a pressure bulb, a regulating valve, and a manometer. So you should have all of that in your lab bag and we will teach you how to use that in lab. And then you're also gonna need a stethoscope. So this is used to listen to that systolic and diastolic pressure. So we'll work through that together in lab as well. So that's your non-invasive ways of measuring blood pressure. And then you have a direct method. So this is done on an in-client setting only. Um, typically a catheter is threaded into an artery under sterile conditions, and it's attached to tubing that's connected to an electronic monitoring system. Pressure is then constantly displayed, displayed as a waveform on the monitor screen. So again, we're talking an ICU setting or some kind of insane setting like that, and this is not typical. And so here's an example of two things that you've probably seen before to take blood pressures. The one on the left is from like 1902 and the one on the right still doesn't look much better, but a little bit better. And so we call those sometimes a, a Dynamap or blood pressure caddy, or you'll probably see it called a million different things. And so measures, uh, methods to measure blood pressure. Um, so you can review this procedure in your book. Um, it's 19-6, okay? Um, and so this is how you're going to measure the blood pressure, okay? Again, see page 471 for the complete process. But basically, you're going to place the stethoscope over an artery. Typically in nursing, for the most, most often, we're going to use that brachial artery in the arm. You're going to inflate the cuff. Once you inflate that cuff, you are going to be listening with your stethoscope at that same time. And once you inflate that cuff above a certain pressure, what you're doing is you're cutting off the heart rate, okay? You're cutting off the blood supply to that arm, okay? Once you start to let deflate the cuff or let that air out, the blood flow starts to come back rapidly through a partially open artery, right? And that's going to produce that sound that you hear through the stethoscope. Once you hear that first heartbeat after you start letting that air out, that is gonna be your top number. And once you hear that very last sound before you hear nothing, that's going to be your bottom number. Okay. You'll get more of, you'll get more information in lab as we go over that, but this is just a little overview. And so here's a review of the quarter cough sounds. There are a variety of sounds that you will hear while you are, um, while you are going through the process of taking the blood pressure. Um, you have to be really good and experienced to kind of realize that you're hearing all of these sounds, but they are all there, okay? So I'll just let you read through these, the first sound to the fifth sound. Um, I, this is a video down here at the bottom right corner. Again, I don't think that it's going to play for me for some reason um, in my video, but I do encourage you again to come back through um, the PowerPoint that I provided to you and to watch these on your own. These, this video will show you all of these five quarter cough sounds that you are supposed to be listening for when you're doing this blood pressure. And so talking about hypotension and hypertension, remember hypo means low, hyper means high, okay? So a normal blood pressure, normal blood pressure, we want the systolic blood pressure to be less than 120 and the diastolic blood pressure to be less than 80, okay? So keep in mind that one blood pressure does not tell you very much information. What you need is a series of blood pressures to determine if the patient has a problem. We are always looking for a pattern. One rogue blood pressure is not going to tell us what we need to know, okay? So keep in mind that hypotension and hypertension are medical diagnoses, but they are also symptoms. They can also, they can be the problem, but they can also be symptoms of another problem, okay? Um, they may be the etiology of a nursing diagnosis as well. And they're treated as collaborative problems with other um, specialties, other providers as well. So hypertension. Okay, so hypertension, physiologically, hypertension is related to the thickening of the arterial walls 
and decreased elasticity of the arteries. Okay, in order to diagnose hypertension, there needs to be multiple elevated blood pressures on different occasions. Okay, again, looking for a pattern. So typically hypertension is diagnosed when blood pressure is persistently above normal um, or when systolic blood pressure is consistently above 140 and diastolic is consistently above 90 on two or more separate occasions, mostly more. So if you have patients with blood pressures greater than 120, you need to follow up. Okay. Is this their baseline or is it new? Okay. Is it related to other factors like white coat syndrome, which is actually something that people have where they, um, where they go through, they're like scared of the doctor. So they come to the doctor and then they always have high blood pressure when they come just because they're so nervous of the doctor. Right. Um, also pain, you know, that could be a contributing factor. So that's why we need multiple blood pressure readings and then eventually a follow-up with the doctor as well. Um, and so hypertension is a major, major cause of illness and death in the United States. Um, it increases stress on the heart and blood vessels. And if untreated, it can lead to heart, renal, cerebral, and respiratory complications. Okay. So Severity is directly related to the degree of elevation. So depending on how high their blood pressure is, that directly relates to how severe the problem is, right? So there's primary or there's essential hypertension. So there's no single cause that's identified, but it's a combination, family, history, age, race, obesity, diet, heavy alcohol consumption, smoking history, high cholesterol levels and stress, all of these can contribute to the development of essential hypertension, right? Primary or essential hypertension. So these are diagnosed when there's no known cause for the increase, but it could be a variety of those problems. It accounts for at least 90% of all cases of hypertension and clients may not have any symptoms of hypertension aside from the high blood pressure, right? So when we're monitoring these patients, we want to make sure that we teach them, we teach them so well. So we want to make sure that they have a blood pressure device at home, and we want to make sure that they know how to use it. That is an important first step. If they are not using their devices at home correctly, then they are not getting accurate information to report back to their physician. So we want to make sure we have them perform a demonstration of the skill so that they can show us that they know how to use the equipment. And then hypotension. So hypotension meaning low blood pressure. So when your systolic blood pressure is less than 100. Okay, so symptoms of that include dizziness, fatigue, concentration problems, activity intolerance, shortness of breath, right? And then like we talked about, there's orthostatic hypotension. So this is hypotension with position changes. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to obtain orthostatic blood pressures. So first getting it while they're supine, then when they're sitting, and then when they're standing. Each reading needs to be one to three minutes after the change of position. Okay, that's important. So let's test your knowledge. So the clinic nurse is reviewing the blood pressure readings from the client's home self-monitoring device. The client states, look, yesterday my blood pressure jumped to 150 over 90. I should be taking more medicine. The nurse's best response is A, yes, that's dangerously high. What were you doing? B, yes, I am sure your physician will want to increase the dose. C, your doctor will first look at the pattern of your results. Or D, don't worry, I'm sure it's just because you were stressed. The correct answer is C. It is important for the nurse to complete client teaching about um, necessity and looking at trends, patterns, and readings rather than just a one-time elevation. Remember, we are always looking for a pattern, okay? And then pain. So pain is considered the fifth vital sign, okay? So we have to assess the pain level every single time we take vital signs. We need to remember that pain is whatever the patient says it is. Okay, it doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter if they're sitting on their phone, not having, not looking like they're in pain. It is whatever they say it is. It's often assessed on a one to 10 scale. And when we're talking about assessing pain, we're going to determine the quality, the length, and the factors that are going to exacerbate the pain, right? We will cover pain more in depth um, 
this week in chapter 32. Um, so when you watch my lecture on that, this is just thinking about, this is just to let you start thinking about it as one of those vital signs, okay? Um, typically the patient and the nurse will set an acceptable pain score. So the patient will say, I can handle a three out of 10 on, a, on the pain scale. And then um, we will deal with higher pain ratings as far as treatments with pain medication and things like that. So here is um, a nursing mnemonic and tip on pain assessments. So when we're talking about um, assessing the quality or the type of pain, we wanna know about the onset. When did it begin? How long did it last? Um, what provokes it? What brings it on? What makes it better? What makes it worse? What is the quality? So what does it feel like? Can you describe it? Is it throbbing, stabbing, dull, that kind of thing? Um, region and radiation. So does your pain radiate? If so, that means like, does it, does it go to another part of your body? Does it go all the way down your back? Um, where does it hurt the most? Where does it go from there? Severity. So on a one to 10 scale, how bad is it? Time and treatment. When did the symptoms first begin? How effective are your pain medications? And then understanding. So asking your patient, what do you believe is causing this? How is this affecting your daily life and your family? And do you have any concerns? So wrapping up vital signs. So let's talk a little bit. What changes occur with vital signs due to age? Can you remember? Push pause so that you can think about that. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you. So Heart rate and respiratory rate are going to decrease with age, right? Blood pressure is going to increase with age as a result of vascular changes, right? So just remember that vital signs are combinations of skills. So it includes temperature, pulse, respirations, blood pressure, and pain, okay? Note here that I did not add O2 saturation on there for your pulse oximetry. It is not technically considered a vital sign, but it is routinely done in the hospital and you need to be prepared how to do it. So it will be one of your vital signs checkoffs, right? Um, so provide, it provides an indication of a person's health and functioning of all body systems. They need to be assessed in totality instead of independently. We need a full set of vital signs so that we can get the full picture. And then responsibility and delegation. So nurses can delegate the activity of taking vital signs. However, the nurse is responsible for interpretation of vital signs, identifying vital sign trends, and making decisions based on those findings. So as a student nurse, you are responsible for functioning within your scope of knowledge. Okay, the professional nurse is never able to relinquish that responsibility of interpretation of vital signs based on abnormal vital signs findings. And then here I will conclude, there's another registered nurse RN video that puts the entire process together. Okay, this site is a really fabulous resource throughout your nursing school career. I cannot say enough good things about registered nurse RN. She's excellent and she really takes all of the enormous amount of content that I'm required to give you and she puts them into small little mini lectures that are really excellent, okay? So again, the links to these videos are all gonna be in this PowerPoint and I encourage you to um, review them all.